Thinking aloud. Conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. We're going to explore today theories of everything. My guest, Dr. Vernon Neppe, is the co-author of a book called Reality Begins with Consciousness, which is the description of his own theory of everything, co-authored with Dr. Edward Close. Dr. Neppe is a neuropsychiatrist, and he is the head of the Pacific Neuropsychiatric Institute in Seattle. He is also world-renowned for his work in deja vu and for his work as a psychopharmacologist and as expressed uh, amongst uh, other books in his book, Cry the Beloved Mind. Welcome again, Vernon. Thank you so much, Jeffrey. Mm -hmm. Now, there are very few people who can develop a theory of everything, and there are very few people who even study theories of everything, but one of the things you've endeavored to do in your work is to look at the whole range of theories that attempt to account for all and everything in the universe. Consciousness, physics, biology, chemistry. That is true, yes. And you've developed uh, a list of criteria for what a good theory of everything would be, but uh, I don't want to go through all 39 points of, of, of the matrix that you have, but let's talk in general about theories of everything for a moment, because there, there are different kinds. For example, there are ancient theories, like Kabbalah or the Vedas. That is true. So there are philosophical theories, mm -hmm. as you've indicated, and most of those are mystical. And we should not deny them in terms of the fact that they have endured for millennia. Mm -hmm. And so one starts saying, what is it that has made these models stay around and for people to entertain them seriously for thousands of years? So that's the philosophical. And then there are the scientific models. And indeed, there had to be ways to measure this. Mm -hmm. Now, as a starter, I must say that, first of all, I never started using the term theory of everything. Uh, Dr. Edward Close and myself developed the model called TDVP, Triadic Dimensional Distinction Vortical Paradigm, and we used the term meta-paradigm. In other words, it was not only a paradigm, a new way of thinking, it was a new way of thinking for all of reality across the physics and the mathematical and mm -hmm. the consciousness and yeah. the psychological and the biological spectrums. So it was a meta-paradigm mm -hmm. and a meta-paradigm shift. And then gradually I had people saying, oh, well, you know, how do you know your theory of everything is better than anyone else's? I'd say, I don't even call this a theory of everything. I dislike the term because the physicists <clears throat> are using it in a very specific sense. Yes. And I'm not trying to prove everything. I'm trying to illustrate certain ideas that do not get contradicted by other kinds of reality. In other words, it's not contradictory, and in that way would be non-contradictory theories of ideas which we could look at. Mm -hmm. So you said, what would be examples? So I started analyzing the ones that seemed the most prevalent, and there were 24, and now they're 25. And when I looked at those, I created a list of criteria and I sent it off to as many of these authors 
of theories of everything that I could find. Some like Kabbalah or Vedic mysticism had to go to those who were representing that field. Mm -hmm. But basically, I got a lot of feedback. And later on when we scored it, I got one or two of them saying, no, 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 I ought to be scored higher at this level. But mm -hmm. I tried to give those bits of feedback and if it was relevant, I adjusted it. Yeah. And so there were broad ideas, general ideas, and those broad general ideas fitted at least 10 of the different theories, 10 mm -hmm. of the different models. So it was based on these categories at least 10 others would have these categories. Mm -hmm. And then there were non-specific, but more specific ones where at least five would have. And then there were more unique features. So a broad category might be mathematics mm -hmm. or consciousness. And consciousness in those theories of everything, 20 of the models involved consciousness to some degree. I just wanted them to at least touch them in terms of the definitions, not go into yeah. detail. So our mm -hmm. uh, model, for example, had enormous amounts of mathematics, but th I'd score it as mathematical even mm -hmm. if there was just a little bit of a mention. You know, for example, um, I think you know that I at one time in my career lived with a cosmologist, Arthur M. Young, who wrote a book called The Reflexive Universe. I don't think you included his in your book, I but I'm pretty sure you're familiar with his I work. I do not include Young's work. Yeah, He has a uh, sort of like a periodic table of everything, hmm. everything from subatomic particles to the world of mythology. You know, it's really interesting because when I was busy contacting these people and sending mm -hmm. out, what do you think of this? The one would write and say, well, what about Laszlo? Mm -hmm. And then I would read Laszlo. Yeah. Or what about uh, uh, the work of X? And I would well, read that Well, you could name work. people, Gebser is another yeah. big meta-theorist, or Teilhard de Chardin. Yes. So, you know, if the question came up, who does one and who does one not include? Yeah. And some of these people really do not fully fit and certainly did not regard their work as theories of everything. Mm -hmm. But it was useful. But eventually, therefore, we at least had a matrix. Initially, there were 35 criteria. By the time this came out for publication, it was accepted for publication the first time in Neuroquantology, our theory, we mm -hmm. spoke about 35. By the time it was coming out, we were already up to 39, and they were kind enough to adjust it. Mm -hmm. And now it's up to like 58. Mm -hmm. So if anybody has a theory of everything, they, they ought to become aware of your 58 criteria to see if, if how their theory measures yeah, up. Yeah, we haven't published the other 19, yeah. but you know, certainly the 39, mm -hmm. and they should. And yeah. um, I would gladly try and include them in any later kind of publication. Mm -hmm. But the scoring system was interesting because yeah. when we started looking at this, you discovered, first of all, that one of the basic theories of everything mm -hmm. is the fundamental, standard, reductionistic, materialistic model of physics. Yeah. That's the fundamental theory of everything. And, and most academics subscribe to it. Right. And of the 39 criteria, it scores 13 out of 39. So in a strange kind of way, I say to myself, there are those that are equal to our standard model of physics, there are those that are worse, and there are those that are better. Mm -hmm. Now what was amazing was in terms of those that are better, there weren't too many in terms of the fact that other than Edward Close and myself, the sky was 19 out of 39. Nobody got more than 19 out of 39. And I keep getting the comment, well, obviously, you developed those criteria. Well, yes, I did develop those criteria, but they were very, very broad, and they were very basic. And 
it, some of those things did not fit and I tried to consult with others in terms of developing it and we looked at every one of these models in detail and described them descriptively, phenomenologically, and said this is how they are and this is how they differ. Mm -hmm. Obviously, we were using our model of TDVP as the basis. So in every one, we would say this is how it differs from it, this is the same. Mm -hmm. But the bottom line is when we score transcendental physics, Ed Close's original theory, mm -hmm. he scored 23 out of 39. Not bad. When we scored my vortex in dimensionalism, that scored, I think, 27 out of 39. Mm -hmm. So those were our two models we worked with. And we said, these are the limitations, these are the restrictions, how can we make it better? Mm -hmm. and eventually we came up with this commonality that the fundamental axiom is that space, time, and consciousness are fundamentally tethered together from the beginning, which is where we got the reality begins with consciousness mm -hmm. idea. And once we had that fundamental idea, it was easy. The uniqueness could be reflected in that word tethering. Mm -hmm. There are not too many theories that have the tethering of reality. A general criterion would be a reality model, and almost everyone has that reality model. The one that we found was extremely important was consciousness, was the idea of d multiple dimensions, a multi-dimensional fabric. So for example, one of our colleagues in consciousness research is Bernard Carr, who yes. developed a multi-dimensional model mm -hmm. and consciousness British, is extremely uh, important. Cosmologist. Yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, who we spoke about the anthropic model and has yes. a major interest mm -hmm. in terms of this. So consciousness, dimensions, infinity. By the time you get to just those three, leave out even mathematics, leave out anything else, you're virtually down to one or two theories. It's really interesting because infinity is the one that largely, largely was ignored, except of course in Kabbalah and in Vedic mysticism. Mm -hmm. Those ones would have the consciousness component and the infinity component, although the question of dimensions is a problem as well with some of these. And so those components, consciousness, dimensions, infinity, throw in a little bit of mathematics, yeah. throw in something relatively unique, those vortices that are involving movements and communications across different dimensions. We call this intervention because it is the ension is for dimension, the indiv is individual, and it's individualized across dimensions. Intervention, I like that word. It has to do with the uh, transfer from one dimension to another. Yes, and within those dimensions as well. So we are talking together, and we have a common reality. Mm -hmm. We also have our own individual reality. And we as a group might have a group reality, and society as a culture, uh, ethnically, whatever. And so I use this whole combination word which some people hate, some people love. And there's a one short version would be ethico, spiritual, bio, psycho, familio, socio, ethnico, cultural mm -hmm. beings. And these different systems all have their own, so to say, sparks, their own reality components. Yes. And this also is incorporated with intervention. I talk about this as being the horizontal as opposed to the vertical transfer of information. So each person's reality is uniquely idiosyncratic, but each person's reality is also common in terms of a commonality in terms of that 
idiosyncratic component. Mm -hmm. And it's the common reality. And then, of course, some of it is their subjective reality that they can experience. But we've spoken about the overt and the covert. And a lot of it is the covert reality that they cannot experience. And of course, these mystical philosophies are big on these covert realities as well. So these are the broader fabrics mm -hmm. of the idea of theories of everything mm -hmm. or meta paradigms mm -hmm. or for those paradigm shifts. And the more they incorporate, the more we have uh, a greater awareness. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying ours is correct, but strangely enough, we score 39 out of 39. And if you talk about theory of everything, you've got to score a perfect score. If you don't, there's a fault, there's a problem. Well, most theories usually try to narrow down. If you can have a, a good theory about, um, well, for example, evolution, biological mm -hmm. evolution is a very broad, all-encompassing theory for biology. And, uh, but it doesn't attempt to explain subatomic particles. Yes, exactly. So these are different components. And when you have these theories, this is why when the physicists use theory of everything and they say, well, you know, it, it ought to link up quantum physics and relativity and gravitation, for example. Yeah. And if you don't have that, you haven't got a theory of everything. In physics, that would be the definition. It would be one way of looking at it. Yeah. But there's this far broader one. To me, one of the criteria is do you deal with life? How do you explain life? How do you explain order? We spoke about multidimensional order, which I was calling ordropy. How do you explain infinity? What is communicating in terms of maybe after death mm -hmm. or before life, so to say, before physical life? Mm -hmm. How is this fitting in? Are there any little fabrics or memories that maybe mm -hmm. are coming through, that are sticking in some kind of cosmic, akashic, or whatever other kind of reality yeah. you talk about. How are things synchronizing? How are they meeting? Because this is also a component. And again, the study of so-called psychic phenomena, of psi, terribly, terribly important, because why are rare events suddenly intersecting why do one find or does one find in a lab that 52 percent might score a score that they should be scoring 50 percent on and others might be scoring 48 percent what is that escape phenomenon what is that rare event happening mm -hmm. why in so-called mediumistic communications and please understand that this Discussion. I'm not coming along and saying these are validated or not validated. That's a whole new discussion. But why are these scoring very, very high percents in terms of veridicality, in terms of subjective truth of being able to establish mm -hmm. these things? You're willing to look at this, and what you're saying is that any theorist worth their salt ought to pay attention to this area instead of burying their head in the sand. Exactly, they have to. And if they don't, they're not really scientists. And so we have this whole group of people who call themselves skeptics. And skepticism is very good. That means I'm a scientist and I look at facts and I draw conclusions. Mm -hmm. But a lot of them are not skeptics. They're pseudo-skeptics. Yeah. They look at facts and they reject the facts because this is impossible because, of course, Another name that comes up is Thomas Bayes and the idea of if there is zero chance of something happening, it doesn't matter if you've got a billion to one evidence, as we have in nine different areas of Psi, it still is impossible. Mm -hmm. Based on your a priori assumption. Exactly that. So, you know, when you start looking at this in terms of theories of everything, you start saying, well, maybe it's all relative. But on the other hand, to me, a theory of everything needs to say, this is our basis in reality. This is where we are living 
in terms of our actual experience, can we explain that? Mm -hmm. And this is our reality existence, and that reality <coughs> existence includes that quantized finite, these little pieces that are all put together compared with this continuous infinite that we can hardly even apprehend, that we can hardly even touch except as reflected almost by a mirror of the finite. And if we can do that, we're getting closer to what we are calling a theory of everything. Now, you've brought up the infinite, and uh, I wonder how does one deal with the infinite in a theory, because any theory has to be finite. Yes, it's a very good question. Where do we cut off? And this introduces Kurt Gödel, yeah. another Gödel, another great uh, mathematician, or Gödel, yeah. some people a will logician. pronounce him, uh, uh, very much so. Mm -hmm. And he said, well, you know, everything is incomplete because everything effectively is within that box and you can't get outside that mm -hmm. box. Outside that box is the infinite. And this is why we regarded his contribution as very important. And why we realized that the infinite had to be part of any real theory of everything, because if it wasn't, it couldn't be a theory of everything. There would be something that it would be missing. Mm -hmm. You cannot sit in a box and see that whole box or outside that box. You have to be outside it. That's, and it, that's essentially Gödel's theory, theorem right there, the incompleteness theorem, that no theory, no system of knowledge is capable of explaining itself. Exactly that. Until you get to the infinite. Uh -huh. Because now you're dealing with a different system of knowledge. You're de dealing with a different basis. And this is why we have previously mentioned this idea of LFAF, lower dimensional feasibility absent falsification. So you don't need to have to falsify everything. Careful of your microphone. You don't need to have to falsify everything. You have to at least say, this is feasible, I can explain it, maybe I can't explain all of it, but I do have little jigsaw puzzle pieces. And that jigsaw puzzle piece, for example, is not one of those 39 criteria, but one of the uh, extra criteria that one has. The because extra you're 19. Putting, yeah, you're putting <laughs> together mm -hmm. pieces of a jigsaw puzzle. Right. Does it fit? If it doesn't fit, you're in trouble. But if it fits and you can't falsify it, or you haven't falsified that, that then is real science. Before it was not regarded as real science, it was regarded as metaphysics. Yes. And if something is metaphysical, then you're ignoring a whole area of real science. And very often you're ignoring a whole area of real science, such as science survival as well, because the pictures are so different. Well, I think what you're referring to here is the philosophy of naturalism, which admonishes that anything metaphysical, supernatural, even transcendental must be ignored. Right, and it not only admonishes it and ignores it, it denies its presence. Yeah. And of mm. course, when our theory was developed, we said it's mm. got to fit the laws of nature. There's no such thing as miracles. There's no such thing as supernatural in our TDVP theory. You say, but this is terrible. The theologians might have an apoplexy. Well, they won't really if they begin to understand that if you're dealing with something in the sixth or seventh dimensional fabric and you're experiencing just a portion of that jigsaw puzzle mm -hmm. in our three dimensions of space and moment in time while we're living, this will appear like a miracle. It will appear supernatural. Yes. But it's not miraculous. It's not supernatural. And if you extend it to the infinite, that is not supernatural either. We are dealing with the na laws of nature and a divinity within that fabric. It's part of the laws of nature. It doesn't mean to say that because an event happens at a particular moment in time, under a particular circumstance, this is supernatural. It's absolutely and truly remarkable. It's truly synchronistic. 
but it's not supernatural. Mm -hmm. We have a couple minutes left, Vernon, so let me ask you, with regard to theories of everything and, and your theory, what, what do you see? Is there a future? Yes, I certainly see a future. One aspect that I see is we have not had anyone being able to contradict our TDVP model. And in terms of the future, I'm not saying this is the whole thing, but it's interesting that over the years, the fundamental axiom has not changed. We are still dealing with an axiom of space, time, and consciousness are tethered together. We are still dealing with an extra component that can be translated there, that mass energy, and if you want meaningful information, are always linked. We are still dealing with the aspect that our mathematics is far more than just calculations, but part of reality. And every time people try to go further and further in this, we discover that there's more one can test. We've generated 600 different hypotheses, and these are the hypotheses for the future. Here's one fundamental example, beautiful. We looked at the different elements of life. You'll remember we called this gimel, the third substance, added to every one of these elements. We discovered that the element silicone is a fundamental element of life. Here's a hypothesis to test. Is it? Well, in aquatic creatures, it might be. We discovered that water, hydrogen hydroxide, contains more gimel, more third substance, which we think is consciousness, than any other substance other than hydrogen. And water is so fundamental. So the future is testing these hypotheses and looking at them and realizing that, wow, there is so much more in terms of scientific exploration than this three dimensions of space and one moment in time. Vernon Neppy, thank you so much for sharing this half hour with me. It's my pleasure, Jeffrey. And thank you for being with us.